Shabbat Shalom. So a priest is conducting a baptism. And in the process of conducting the baptism, he makes a mistake. You might be wondering what possible mistake can you make? You just have to make sure the kid is wet. But it's a mistake of the formula, the declaration. And instead of saying, I baptize you in the name of such and such and such and such, he says, we baptize you in the name of so and so and such and such. Any problems? More people have to get wet. Well, actually, this is a true story that was just uh, in the news, just, uh, just this last week, I believe. Uh, it means that the decades in which the priest has been saying the formula wrong, he never baptized anyone. They're not baptized. They have not been entered into the sacraments of the Catholic Church. And more than just needing a little sprinkling to catch up, it means every sacrament that they have had since their supposed baptism is zero. Zero. They have never had communion, regardless of what they have done at a church. They have never had confirmation, regardless of how they have participated. They have never been married, if they are married to someone under the Catholic auspices. And their children are not considered to have been born in wedlock uh, because they were never married in that process. Oiga volt, but not exactly Latin. Uh, Oiga volt is not a Latin phrase, but it certainly sums up the situation. And indeed, the, uh, the, the Vatican has put together a website for any people who feel they may have been affected by this to submit their information in order to um, remedy everything that is a consequence of switching from the first person singular to the first person plural. Switching the language from I baptize you to we baptize you. Why is this an issue? I'm not, I'm not expecting you to all be canon law lawyers, but what, what might be the issue behind why it needs to be said as I baptize you by the priest rather than we baptize you? Where does the authority rest? With the priest, right? That, now you probably are like scratching your heads because like good Jews, you know the rabbi has no authority, <laughs> right? And I don't mean that too facetiously, I mean that legitimately, right? If, if I say the wrong words at a brit milah, is the child still a part of the covenant? Of course, of course, right? There, there are, no, there is no reason you need a rabbi at a wedding. You just need someone to actually help the bride and groom conduct themselves through the wedding according to Jewish law. But that could be Shlomo Shapiro, the tailor who happens to know the ceremony very well and is able to help the bride and groom. There is no added sanctity by the officiant, merely choreography for what the sanctity is of the event by the participants themselves. But in the Catholic Church, the hierarchy of authority and the hierarchy of, of power is very, very strong. And a priest has the power to perform sacraments and a lay person does not. And as such, saying we implies apparently irrevocably in the eyes of the, the church that the authority was not coming from the apostolic succession down through the priestly line, but instead the authority was coming by consent of the community. And the community has no authority, only the secession of priestly ordination. There are some emergency procedures. There are, um, for example, emergency baptisms where there is no priest available and the baby is going to die and they want to allow the baby to be baptized for, for their religious needs. Uh, and under those circumstances, indeed, a lay person can do it, which will then be stamped by the priest after the fact as being official once the priest has ascertained they haven't done anything wrong. 
So the priest still has the ultimate authority, and so too with last rites. Yes, there can be emergency confessions. Uh, this was a big issue in, for example, wartime, uh, to people that are not priests, but it still needs to be vouched for, verified by, uh, confirmed by, by the representative. And in this particular case, you might be thinking, well, come on, couldn't we get around this? No, the Vatican is very clear. The priest didn't say the right words. The priest implied that it was the community rather than him. Therefore, it didn't happen. And because it didn't happen, everything else that is contingent upon baptism as the entry into the sacrament system of Catholicism also didn't happen. Ah, indeed. Uh, this is great surus for, for many, many thousands of people who were baptized under this uh, priest during his decades of service. He has retired from pastoral care uh, in light of all of this. Uh, some other job, I'm sure, is available for him. One perhaps without so much proofreading responsibility. But in Judaism, all of you are kind of stunned by this, and that is because you recognize not only does the rabbi not have the authority, but where does the authority lie? The, the, the personal and the communal. The personal and the communal have authority more than the rabbi. Yes, I have authority that you have granted me to make decisions regarding Jewish law on behalf of this community because you respect and recognize the training and the acknowledge the, the smicha, the ordination that was given to me by others that you respect as being someone fit to take on that role for your community. And if you decided I wasn't fit to do that, what would happen? You'd get another rabbi. You'd fire me, right? And that's okay. Not that I'm recommending it. <laughs> but Jewishly, but Jewishly, that is okay. For a synagogue to say, you know what? Rabbi so-and-so, you're not working out. And uh, I think we're not a good fit for each other. So why don't you find a different congregation? We'll find a different rabbi and we'll all be friends. That's perfectly fine. In Catholicism, if you are part of a parish and you don't like your priest, and remember, you don't get to pick your parish except by your zip code, and you don't like your priest, tough, tough. <laughs> tough. That's the priest that the church put there. You do not get a say in who your priest is. Yes, you can complain and raise a stink to the higher ups, but the chances of anything being done are very, very small. But in Judaism, it is the community. If you put 10 rabbis together in a room, what do you have? A minion. And an argument, probably, but a minion. If you put 10 13-year-old Jewish children in a room, what do you have? A minion. Also a minion. No, no, they'll probably get on better than the rabbis. If you put nine rabbis in a room, what do you have? Nine rabbis. You don't have a minion. Rabbis don't count double. We don't have uh, extra minioneering powers. Right? Having, an extra, having a rabbi in the room doesn't add to the count. Having another person in the room adds to a count. Rabbis are people too, important to remember. But people are also people too. And no one gets counted more than any other one. Which means that there are certain things that we can only do with a minyan. Does anyone know the, uh, the short list in our service of what we need a minyan for? Uh, Kaddish. 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 All the Kaddishes. Reading Torah. reading Torah. That is to say, reading Torah officially with the brachot. You can always read Torah just as study, but to do it officially as the mitzvah for the kahal, for the community, you need a minyan. Kedusha, during the Amida, the Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh section of the Amida. Without that, without the minion, we don't do that section. Instead, we do the two sentences, uh, abbreviated version of declaring God's holiness. And the Baruch Hu, spoken like someone who's here before, uh, before 10 o'clock. And the Baruch Hu. Now, those are the main things that you need a minion for. And according to our understanding within Jewish tradition, they all have something in common. Those are all declaration of God's holiness. You don't need a minion, although it's good to have a minion for a wedding. If you don't have a minion, it still counts. 
We do want a minion. You don't need a minion for a funeral. You don't need a minion for a brit milah. All of those, of course, it's best to have. But in order to do the Kedusha, in order to do the Kaddish, in order to do the Barhu, in order to read Torah publicly, officially, we need a minyan. Because God is only sanctified by the we and not the I. God is only access, has access to be able to be proclaimed in the world through the, the magnitude of the holiness that God has and the vision that God has for the world when we come together, not I. I can stand on a street corner as much as I want and shout at people about how important God is and how Judaism is wonderful. I wonder how long that would take uh, before there was problems. Probably longer than if I was waving a swastika. <laughs> Maybe less, depending upon the neighborhood. But I could do that all day. And I would not have, according to Judaism, truly proclaimed God's holiness. But I can take 10 people together, put them into our sanctuary, open up our cedarim, and now we have. Because we have recognized that each other, together, as a community, that is the portal for God's holiness to enter into this world. That is the gateway that is created by the presence of those who wish to congregate in order to proclaim it to the world. God is not some secret, it is not some isolated uh, power that is only transmitted to the few worthy along the hierarchy. God is there for all, but only when all are together, or at least a representation of the all. Judaism is saturated with the first person plural. We are saturated by anachnu, by we, us, over and over again. It is a drone throughout the entire service. And it is not accidental. It is not because of a lack of creativity among those who wrote our tefillot, our prayers. It is because they recognize that prayer is ultimately, in its highest form, a reflection of us reaching as us towards God and of proclaiming God's holiness into this world as us. That is why we're here together. It's why people are joining us through live stream to have that connection. Technically, you could all be doing almost all of this, except for the few things we mentioned, at home by yourself. I guarantee it'd be faster. You wouldn't have any sermon. But it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't have the same power and effect on the world, and it wouldn't have the same power and effect on you. This is why we work hard to try and maintain our Sunday minion here at Temple Israel, when it's not as likely to get quite so many people, although I will say we have a great track record. And tomorrow is President's Day weekend. I hope we'll still be able to uh, get people to show up both in person and through the live stream, Zoom. It's why we are working extra hard to try and buttress and support the minyan through the community minyan that is held at the Jewish Academy of Orlando, uh, entrance through the JCC. Every day, Monday to Friday, eight o'clock, both in person as well as through Zoom. I will say we do not have quite as good a track record there. Why, you ask, or at least I hope you're asking, rather than asking when do we eat. We have fewer people in Temple Israel, as a congregation, than we do in the Orlando Jewish world. That should be obvious, I hope, right? We are part of the Orlando Jewish world, therefore, as a subset, logic tells us, the larger set must have more. So why is it we are able to maintain a minion for our weekday service on Sunday here, but we are having trouble with a minion through the academy minion, the community minion in, in, in Maitland each day? Perhaps eight o'clock, too early for people, although really how hard as it is to roll out of bed and switch on Zoom. Perhaps people are too busy. Or perhaps it is precisely because we do not feel a connection. We don't feel a call. Here at Temple Israel, this is your synagogue. This is your community. Maybe you don't know everybody in the room. Maybe you don't know everybody who's coming in through the live stream. Maybe you don't know everybody you see at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But you know they are you. They are us. They are part of this collective. And as such, you feel a connection, a, a, a calling to be together with them. And it is much harder to form that connection to everyone in the Jewish community. That seems like a they rather than an us cl cluster of people. 
I want to strongly encourage you to think of them as being part of us and us as part of them. We are part of the broader Orlando community. It's been harder to feel that over the last couple of years, even as we have been able to maintain so much of our connection during COVID within Temple Israel, it's been very hard to have those uh, moments of connection outside of Temple Israel with the other Jews of Orlando. The minion is an essential element to this community and something that we should be proud that we have maintained and something that we should be proud to help maintain. If you're looking for an easy entry point, I lead services there in person every Tuesday morning, eight o'clock. If you wanna come and say hi, I promise no sermon, but I'll be there. And if you wanna come through the Zoom, the link is in your handout or on the website or on Facebook or on WhatsApp or any of the other places where you get your information about TI. Stop by, be part of us. Because remember, it's not about me, it's about we. Shabbat Shalom.